Hi, in this session, we're really turning to focus on the issue of practice and how do we turn some of these ideas that we've been talking about around social justice into practical things that we can actually do in a classroom or when we're counselling a client. So I'm going to present the five signposts to socially just career guidance, which I've talked about before and which are drawn from books that I've worked on with Ronald Sultana and Rhea Thompson and particularly from the one which we call Career Guidance for Emancipation. So if you want to look at some of the kind of literature that sits behind this, um, it's really in, in that book. So what we're trying to do then is really think about how do we turn the ideas, which can sometimes be quite sort of abstract and philosophical ideas around notions of justice and social justice, how do we turn them into something which we can actually work with in the intensely practical world of career guidance. When people come to us, they're coming with an individual problem. They're coming with something that they want to discuss and want to uh, solve or work through. They're not coming because they normally want to do something about wider social inequalities. What we've tried to argue in this course is that these wider social inequalities inevitably have an impact on their career and their prospects for career development. But it doesn't get away from the fact that people aren't coming for a lecture on capitalism or feminism or whatever. People are coming to us because they've got an issue that they want to talk about. So in order to try and address that, we've, we've tried to draw out some of the key ideas in the uh, social justice approach and and turn it into five practical things which we call the five signposts towards socially just career guidance. So these five signposts are not the only things you can do and you don't have to necessarily try and do all of them but they're hopefully a useful set of pointers about ways in which you might seek to implement the ideas of socially just career guidance. So our first one is, is what we call critical consciousness. So it's helping people to think about and understand the world as it is. Think about why things are organized in the way that they are. So ask who benefits from the current order, for example, considering what can be changed and how we might go about changing it. So this, this idea of critical consciousness is simply helping people to understand the situation they're in. And it's helping them to understand that by thinking about the broader context within which they operate. Just because we understand how the world works doesn't necessarily mean that we can change it, but it's a good start. So that's where we start. We start by building people's critical consciousness. And I'm going to try and give a series of examples which all come from the Career Guidance for Social Justice website. And so I'm really just going to briefly introduce these and encourage you to go up and look at these more. So Anne Delazon at the University of Reading uh, runs a workshop which she calls I Want to Make a Difference. And that's really asking students to think about how the labour market is working, how some of the assumptions that they have about the labour market are, to investigate that and then to think about how that might influence their career. Um, she's particularly looking at it, and there's a resource here that you can look at more, um, through the one of the key lenses is the issue of gender inequality and the pay gap. And so she gets students to talk about this and think about this. So this is an example of, of, of one of these uh, sort of initiatives that are trying to build critical consciousness to help people to understand the context within which they're operating their career more. So our second uh, idea is, is to name oppression. So um, we, I've probably introduced to you before the idea of oppression and particularly the work of Iris Marion Young. And she says, for every oppressed group, there is a group that benefits from that oppression and is privileged in relation to that group. So oppression is not just against a group, it's also in favour of another group. So they are poor because we are rich and so on. What, what Iris Marion Young does is she she draws out the, the different ways in which oppression can work. She talks about exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism and violence. So you might feel that you're not fairly compensated, that your work is not valued. You might feel that you're pushed to the edge in the organizations that you work and you don't have um, 
much ability to influence how things operate. You might find that you're powerless, you're always on the receiving end of orders. Or you might find that other people are always imposing their norms on you. We're going to talk a bit more about that in a second. And you might also find that you're experiencing violence, either physical violence in some cases, but probably more usually in the workplace, bullying, sexual harassment, uh, these kinds of, uh, of things, which are, are forms of verbal violence. So Iris Marion Young helps us to understand the feelings that people get when they're oppressed and talking to people, perhaps in a career counselling session about some of these things can be a helpful way to unlock their experience and see what is actually happening to them. Now on our, our website, on the Career Guidance for Social Justice website, uh, we've got a really nice article by Tahira Majothi, who talks about how to respond to the Black Lives Matter movement through, particularly in the case of higher education career services. And I won't go through all of her advice, but it's got a lot of advice about how we can pick some of these issues up and try and respond to them in, in forms of practice. So for example, by listening and learning, by recognizing what she calls microaggressions. So those small things that people experience, which, which remind them of their oppression and so on. And she comes up with lots of ideas of things that we can do about that. A third uh, signpost is the idea that we question what's normal. Our societies, of course, define what's normal and natural, and, and there needs to be some norms in society, otherwise every decision we made would need to be completely re rethought and renegotiated. But one of the problems is that when we talk about things like career and career success and what a good education is and a fulfilled life is, we're, we're throwing a lot of norms around we're throwing a lot of ideas about what how things should be and perhaps we're not interrogating them as deeply as we could do so one of the things that we need to recognize is that what is seen as normal will vary for different kinds of people different kinds of people think what's normal is it has different uh, a different nature so we want to be aware of that we want to think about what we're assuming is normal and, and we want to kind of think about, you know, whether we want to question that and encourage our clients and our students to question what they assume to be normal. You know, is it always necessarily better to earn more money? Is it always necessarily better to assume that what you want is to own a house and to have a, a family and, and so on? These are, these are norms which, if we're helping people to think about their career, we need to help them to think through quite deeply and to question. So uh, Frida Wickstrand on the Career Guidance for Social Justice website and in the books that we've produced talks about norm criticism as an idea that they've used a lot in Sweden. And she says we, we should look for and reduce and challenge examples of stereotypes and bias in labour market information. We want to challenge the assumed pathways, uh, the idea that certain people go to university and others go into vocational education, for example. We want to encourage students and clients to reflect on what they see as normal and consider whether they're happy with this. For example, do they aspire to have a heterosexual nuclear family? And is this the only way to live your life? Well, clearly it isn't. So sometimes people, we, we might be encouraging people and supporting people to think about things which are norm critical. And we want also to encourage practitioners and ourselves to be reflective about what we think is normal and our use of norms. Next one is about encouraging people to work together. So we've talked a lot about this already, but career is not an individual activity. It's something that we do with others, um, sometimes cooperating, sometimes competing. Uh, we have a range of strategies for, that can improve our career through collective action as well as through individual action. And recognizing the importance of cooperation and collective struggle opens up all of these new opportunities of how we can actually advance our career development. So an example that I, I created was a, a workshop that I ran for a series of researchers in universities. And I got them to work together to write an open letter to, to argue with their employers about what makes academic employment unjust, what evidence they have for this. What evidence do you have that this could be a good thing? And, and basically to make a series of, of demands. Um, 
And, and the idea of giving them this method of an open letter was a strategy that they could use to bring together people around a series of demands that they might be all experiencing individually. And I used as a stimulus for that a video uh, from our trade union as, as a way of, of thinking about how we might bring together collective action, what some of the problems might be and the kind of way that academic work is organised and so on. Now, this is just an example. You, you might find other examples that, that are similar, but this, this was a good way of trying to give people both a recognition that the, the issues they had in their career were not individual, they were collective, and also that, the, um, that there were collective strategies they could adopt to respond to that. Finally, we need to recognise that our work uh, needs to take place at a range of levels. Of course, our career takes place in our psychologies, our families, our workplaces, communities, and so on. So as a career counsellor or a career development professional, you should feel free to intervene, uh, providing people with support, advocating for them, providing feedback into the system when it's not working well, and potentially even getting involved in campaigns and so on. So an example on the, the website is um, a campaign that's going on for universal basic income, which is a different way of organising money and um, organising uh, welfare and benefit payments. And there's an article here where we arg argue that this is really important and something that needs to be thought about when we're thinking about people's careers. So what I've tried to do is to just illustrate these five signposts as a way for you to think about how you might operationalise some of these ideas around social justice. There's a lot more for you to have a look at on the Career Guidance for Social Justice website, and I've provided you with particular links here. Um, and then obviously there's the references to the books that we've, we've talked about quite a lot. Thank you for listening. I hope some of that was of you.